than many of the other states. And um, so uh, if you look at, uh, if you break that out separately, uh, it really reinforces the point that uh, many of our students are very well served by the traditional public school system, and they are doing well. Uh, the report focuses on more on the individuals who are not served well by the traditional public schools, and many of those are uh, low income and uh, uh, non-white uh, students, and they uh, show up less well on the SATs and less well in all of our standard measures. And, and we promoted uh, charter schools uh, specifically to help serve those hard to serve or those underserved individuals. Thank you. Hello, Fredericks, a City Club member. First disclosure, I was a teacher at Metropolitan Learning Center, one of my first jobs in Portland. So uh, alternative programs are um, very close to my heart. And in fact, MLC would in any other city be called a charter school. And that's one of the points that I think I'd like to make. There are a number of them, and I don't, I only have two minutes or less than that now. So I'll try to go into my, te my television mode and get in there in that, in that period of time. Um, small schools are, in fact, very important. Small classes are, in fact, very important. Um, our budget situation simply isn't going to happen with small schools or small classes right now. We are, in fact, increasing the class size in Portland. And they're increasing the class size in Coos Bay and in Grants Pass and in all the other school districts across the state because we haven't funded schools. And we need to go back again to that particular point. I am frankly disappointed in the report. I think there are huge holes, and I believe also it's uh, clear bias uh, on a number of things, taking at face value uh, anything that is said is in terms of uh, criticism. I am uh, very disappointed with the report for that reason, and I can go down the list, but I will not because I've got 45 seconds left. Uh, let me just put one quick thing. Um, Steve mentioned something, mentioned a number of reports, and I would like to just give you, there's a stack of things here. A number of them are the reports that Steve mentioned. This is, we have in the past created uh, a number of, uh, of guides to the Portland schools. A new one will be coming out that's a catalog, uh, and try to get that to people. It costs money to do that. We have not been able to do that, both to, both to develop it and to get it out. And he's given me 15 seconds. There are a number of other issues and a number of other programs that are, in fact, available to find out how to create charter schools that have been developed within the district. I was never asked about those particular programs. I was asked about a couple of things, and Steve and I talked briefly about some things, but we were not able to get other things to them. They are available. They have, they, we've been working on them, and that would have been important. Thank you. Sure. Dan Anderson, uh, study committee member and city club member. I kind of touch on a couple of points here quickly. First of all, with regard to the cumulative effects of measures 5, 47, and 50, I would direct your attention to chapter 5 of the report where the issue is specifically treated. Um, with regard to parental involvement, uh, certainly the experience of many jurisdictions suggests that if parents are of a mind to abandon the public school system for whatever reason, they will in fact do so. And, and you get the kind of participation rates that characterize jurisdictions like Seattle, San Francisco, Baltimore, Chicago, and, and so forth. And, and I don't think you can compel involvement by parents simply by declining to engage with, with charter schools. Um, and sort of the, the final sort of broad point I, I, I would make is that, and the report also makes, is that charter schools are public schools, just a different flavor. Um, and, and, and we shouldn't conflate um, charter schools and, and, and the different approaches to that with, with the general challenge that this state and, and more specifically the legislature currently faced with adequacy of funding for public schools generally. Um, those are two different issues and um, I, I don't think uh, a view on one necessarily mandates a view on the other. I encourage you to vote in favor of the report. Thank you. I'm Sue Hagmeyer, a um, member of the Portland School Board and chair of the Education Options Committee of the Portland School Board. Um, I'm not sure actually whether I'm for or against the report. Um, I'm 
but uh, I will say that um, we've, we've had, um, the report mixes a lot of issues and it's complicated to ferret that out. And um, I received a copy last Friday morning because I went and got it. Um, other district personnel got it Tuesday. Um, I would, um, I s definitely have more than two minutes worth of comments on it and uh, um, would have really liked to uh, prepare formal comments. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say that if anybody asks you whether you're for or against charter schools, they're asking a political question, not an educational one. Um, I think I can speak for the full board in saying that we're for good schools. And, uh, um, and in addition, I think I can speak for the full board by saying that, um, that we know that we will stand or fall on school choice, that we have to provide choices. The world just expects that nowadays. Um, uh, it's been pointed out that we've moved forward um, in our support of school choice um, by developing policies um, that map out some of the, um, the, the um, uh, complicated laws and uh, rules that the state has regarding different kinds of choices of schools. It, unfortunately, the report does mix issues of alternative schools and charter schools in a way that's uh, very hard to sort out. Um, it's been pointed out recently in a Brookings Institute report that, um, that, uh, that speaks to the failures of some charter schools that states with the most permissive laws are the ones that are seeing more catastrophic failures of charter schools a few years in. Um, there is an appropriate uh, recommendation that um, education should emphasize performance and results rather than methods and processes, but then it goes on to advocate site-based management, which is a process, and support for charter schools, which are, which are a method. Um, I'd like to comment uh, on, the, um, on the funding formula and some other things, but I don't have time. Thank you. I would like to ask for a motion to cease debate. And that will need... As a, um, as a member of the No Child Left Behind organization, which is spearheaded by the Vice Chair McCoy's board, may I please have two minutes to, to uh, address the issue since, since I'm the only one standing. Since we have a motion standing. on the floor, um, I'd be happy to honor that. If you could please make it 60 seconds. Okay, I will. Thank you. Uh, very, very, very briefly, I think the issue of charter schools has been approached in Oregon without the uh, benefit of certainly experience and possibly open-mindedness. Um, I, I would like to quote from the man who did the audit on McCoy, Robert Yingling. He's given me permission to use his name, and he's going to put it in writing. In his opinion, as the auditor regarding the financial stability of McCoy, McCoy was set up for failure. Again, my name is Ron Popkin. I stand by that. That's what the auditor told me. Okay. I believe there's a lot of good intentions in Oregon and Portland in particular, but with the lack of experience, the lack of something to rely on, I feel that charter schools, McCoy being the first of them, was not given a fair chance to prove its worth or non-worth. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So we will have the vote now to cease the debate. All those in favor, please raise your card. Two-thirds. All right. Um, now we will vote on the acceptance of the Charter Schools in Portland report. All those in favor? And we need, we need a count. Please keep your cards up. Ah, OK. All those opposed? Let me, let me just see, see the uh, in favor again, please. Okay. We don't need to two thirds. Thank you. So the report is accepted. And thank you all for, for such important comments. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, we are going to run until 1.30. We need to give our speaker his full, our full attention and his full time. So thank you very much. I apologize for the, um, how long this has taken. Okay. Now, now to the City Club program. Um, we've got quite, a, quite a, a program today. We have Bill Hiller, and I will introduce him in a moment. First, I'm going to give a few announcements. Um, 
Okay, next week here at the MAC, our program will be Mistakes in Medicine, Disclosure and Improvement, featuring Dr. Susan Toll, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Center for Ethics uh, in Healthcare at OHSU, and Dr. Christine Cassell. She is Dean of the School of Medicine at OHSU. Um, please pay particular attention to your bulletins in the coming week. They'll contain several uh, board-approved resolutions on ballot measures. And those resolutions are based on related research reports and club positions on these issues. In addition, we have four committees busily studying five of the measures that will be on the ballot. And these reports will be coming to you for debate and voting in the next several weeks. On those days, we'll begin, as we did try to do today, um, at 12, so that we can cover the whole, uh, all that information. Anyone interested in obtaining a video or audio of this program or other City Club programs, please call the office. There are 10 for audio and 20 for video. Our board host seated at the table is uh, Patty Tillett, past president and um, member of the Board of Governors. He is a principal at Zimmer, Gunsel, and Frasca architectural firm. And he will have the privilege of asking our speaker the first question. Following, way, uh, following Patty's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members here in the audience, and you may use either of the microphones. Um, broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente, Wells Fargo, and Zimmer Gunsel Frasca. Thank you, our sponsors. Um, today, Bill Hiller will speak to you on um, many issues around this, this tremendous year after the tragedy of September 11th, 2001. Um, he is an international consultant and trainer specializing in the development of human capital. And since his whole career has been in this area, but specifically this last year, he's been very much focused on um, uh, presentations in the cor uh, in, and courses in domestic and world terrorism, and his clients consist of the FBI, state and local law enforcement personnel, um, emergency 9-11 personnel, firefighters, and private and public sector organizations. Bill uh, is a retired Army colonel and um, comes to us today from the Tri-City area, Kennewick, Pasco, Richmond, and um, has a doctoral degree from, uh, in health education from our own University of Oregon uh, and was raised in Hawaii. So I give you our speaker, Bill Hiller. Can I take this microphone out and use it? I guess I can, but should I? this mess up your uh, recording? I, I'm really nervous, and the reason I am is because I've, I've never been asked to speak for only 25 minutes. <laughs> and, and I'm very passionate about what I speak about. Uh, and so I'm going to try to cram in three days of uh, my passion into 25 or so minutes. And if, Susan, if you'll let me know when I have five minutes left. Um, boy, it's almost been a year. and. Um, uh, what I reflected on when I was asked to come here was uh, what is the definition of learning because if the topic is supposed to be what have we learned in the past year uh, and I remember Psych 101 when the Earth's crust was cooling when I was in school as a, as a freshman I remember the definition of learning was a change in behavior brought about by some experience and if your behavior hasn't changed as a result of seeing the planes fly into the World Trade Center in the Pentagon or the, uh, the plane get forced down, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Northeast, if your behavior hasn't changed, you know what? You haven't learned a damn thing. You haven't learned a damn thing. Your behavior must have changed. Now, I'm not going to ask you, it's rhetorical, you know, has your behavior changed? I know mine has, you know, and of course, how do you define that? We get complacent when we're 3,000 miles away from trauma. And, you know, the, seeing the images on television and those types of things are, were, were very traumatic. In fact, 60% of the population probably for three months was suffering some type of, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Not syndrome, but disorder. Actually had the symptoms of some of the, uh, the symptoms of the syndrome of the post-traumatic stress. Um, so I know that, you know, it affected most of us. Um, I know the definition of insanity is when you continue to do the same thing and expect different results. And I don't know how many of you sitting here are expecting different results from our government, or if you think you're separated from the government, if you are, then maybe you ought to find out who's sitting in your seat. 
because it's not you. We need to take a look at ourselves now, and I've had an opportunity to really reflect on things. And, and let me ask you this. How many of you have ever seen this in real life or maybe uh, on television or, or, or something? There's an 85-year-old man. He's walking down the street. He's a picture of health. He's a patriarch of the family. He's community-oriented. Uh, he started and passed off two or three businesses. He he's, he's belongs to four or five different service clubs, and he's just feeling great. And all of a sudden, he gets chest pains. And he's saying to himself, my gosh, I haven't had chest pains like that ever. I, uh, I better go to the doctor. So he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, Al, I'm glad you came to me because uh, at your age, it could be something serious. So he says, I don't have enough equipment here in the office. We better send you to the hospital to find out where we can do some contrast procedures to see what, what's really wrong. So they admit him to the hospital and come to find out he's got a condition called congestive heart failure, which is what seven of you have. It's just not diagnosed yet. Okay. So, you know, sometimes when you go into a hospital, it's like a house of cards. You get one diagnosis and you get another diagnosis. Pretty soon you have what we call multiple morbidities and you got four or five things that happen. It happened to this 85-year-old man. And the doctors on the third day begin to realize, my God, he's spiraling down. He'll probably be dead in two weeks. So the word goes out to the loved ones, come and say your goodbyes to grandpa, great grandpa, your friend. And the fourth day he's in the hospital, he's sitting up in bed with a nasal cannula pumping two liters of oxygen into his nose. And a 14-year-old grandson who looks at him as a mentor comes in because he wants to be alone with his grandfather. And he grabs a hold of his hand and he begins to talk. And he says, Grandpa, I, I didn't think you were going to die. And I, I, and he chokes up and he can't talk. And they communicate for 20 minutes just with facial expressions and squeezing each other's hand. Finally, after things calm down, the 14-year-old says, I really love you. I really respect you. I, I need to ask you a question. I want to lead my life just like you led yours. Grandpa, if you had your life to live over again, would you do anything different? And his grandfather says, I'm glad you asked me that because, yeah, if I had my life to live over again, I believe I'd have spent more time at work. <laughs> have you ever heard that before in real life? <laughs> And since you're all dying, what would your response be to that? How many here would really rather spend more time at work? Oh, I'm not going to raise my hand. Yeah. What do you think the people who are now dead, that were in the World Trade Center and on that plane and, uh, you know, in the Pentagon, are thinking about work, you know? Is your life's work work? Is your life's work life? Well, when I think of this little anecdote that I just shared with you, it puts me in a mental frame that says, OK, Bill, just what the heck have you learned this past year? And I'm representing me. I don't represent the federal government, the Department of Defense, the, you know, the Department of Justice, or anything I, I represent. I have to say, this gentleman here, would you stand up for a minute, the guy in the multicolored thing? Anybody that doubts that God has a sense of humor, <laughs> take a look at this guy. I think this is great. Thank you. I just had to say that. I thought of you, and I thought of the duckbill platypus, and I thought, yes, God has a sense of humor. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this, but our IQ, which is a measure of potential, does not increase between the age, you know, after about the age of 17. And we don't really reach self-actualization until around age 65. So I wonder what the heck we're doing between the ages of 17 and 65. Well, hopefully, we're learning. And here's some of the things I've learned in the past year about Americans, including myself. I think the first thing I learned when I watched those images on television was that Americans are some of the most caring, patriotic, compassionate, and courageous people I've ever had the opportunity to live with. And I've spent 22 years of my life out of this country. It is good to be in the United States, let me tell you. And some of the things that validate and actually prove what I just said, at least to me, are that, you know, when we first did the search and rescue, when we went back into the towers in the Pentagon, and pretty soon after three days, it evolved into recovery. Do you know that up until about three weeks ago, when they finally terminated all the uh, removal of, the, uh, of whatever it was they were removing from ground zero, they found a, a small body parts, but they still put it on a, a stretcher, put an American flag on it. Everybody took their hats off, and they, and they had a show of respect while they carefully took the remains of whoever it was and put it on, you know, in, a, in an ambulance and, and took it to the, to the morgue. And we've seen that, you know, for eight or nine months 
during that evacuation. If you haven't had an opportunity or did not have an opportunity to go to ground zero and actually get the feeling that you get there, uh, it is something that you will never, never forget. It's awe-inspiring, it's painful, and it's very growth-producing. I'm glad that I'm an American, that I live in this country, and that I have an opportunity to, uh, 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 to speak to you. The second thing I've noticed is that and because of my background, our military preparedness for what happened to us is exemplary. It is exemplary. In 1986, the Delta Force, and some of you don't know what that is, and if your mentality is only what you read or see on television, it's warped. But I will tell you this, in 1986, the Army put Delta Force together and said, you know what, we need to redefine our identity because there's never going to be another World War I, World War II, Korea, or Vietnam. We're going to have a lot of more conflicts, not those kinds of wars, and we have to be able to prepare for them. So they developed this fast reaction, quick recovery teams. And if you want to know how it works, I will tell you. On September 12th of last year, at 2.30 in the morning, I was woken up in my bed in Richland, Washington, by my phone. And I picked it up and I said, hello. And a voice said to me, Colonel, we're at Lima Site 35. Wish us luck. And they hung up. Where is Lima Site 35? It's at the 12,200 foot level in the Hindu Kush, just above Kabul in Afghanistan. This country had already inserted special ops teams less than 24 hours, a little more than 24 hours later. And you know, I, I just had to, you know, it just sent chills down my spine thinking, yeah, we are prepared, at least the military is. So that's another thing that's different. I, you know, I, have, I have some hope in the military. We don't do well at times because you can look at Somalia and, and Grenada and uh, uh, Haiti and those types of places, but we're working on it. And it's something we civilians have to work on as well. Third thing I found out that we've learned, that I've learned, is that the contingency plans that uh, the Secret Service had to protect our leaders, the President, the Vice President, the you know, President Pro Tem of the Senate, uh, Speaker of the House, uh, you know, it worked because nobody knew where Dick some, Today, people don't know where Dick Cheney is, but you know, um, but you know, we didn't know where Dick Cheney was. We didn't know where the president was. We didn't know, you know, where the president's cat was. We knew where Bill Clinton was, but we didn't know where the rest of them were. Okay, so so something worked. The fourth thing that I that I know we've learned is that th this is one of the most diverse countries in the world in terms of race, uh, ethnicity religion, and, and just about every diverse characteristic you can put a label on. If you ever travel to other countries, they're generally ethnocentric. Well, we have a tendency to be ethnocentric when things get tight. But in this country, when, when we were attacked, I saw for the first time in my life that it really clicked with me that, damn, diversity is the key to synergy. All those different types of people working together, we kicked butt. And you know, we, we, you know, we helped ourselves. And I had never seen that before. And I'm thinking it's pretty tragic that it took an attack on this country for us to actually realize that. And I hope we don't lose sight of that because we really need each other. So I was really glad to see that, that, that diversity. It's, it's powerful. The fifth thing I've noticed was that, damn it, we still have a tendency to point the finger and blame. Two days after the attack, I, w I watched people in the Senate going like this on television. I want to find out who in the FBI and the CIA and the NSA are responsible, and anybody else in the intelligence community who are responsible for this happening. Where did they screw up? And I wanted to leap through that television and wring this person's neck because for 22 years our intelligence community has been begging Congress for money so that we could upgrade our intelligence gathering and, and information data. Yet it was the same congressmen and women who were saying, you know, I want to find out who's responsible. We need to take a look at how we integrally affect other people, not only in this room and in the places of business we work, but in this country. If you're sitting at the table that you are now and you don't understand what's going on in Cairo right now in terms of people's mentality about the United States, you're not learning much. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, we have a tendency to blame. Um, uh, and I think we need to be solution-focused rather than fault-focused and, and, uh, and barrier-focused. And I'm finding that, that actually people are doing that. And I think that's great, and I'm glad to be a part of it. The other thing is, I think we need to live our lives out loud. Live our lives out loud. I had a, I can't tell you the story because I don't have that much time, but in 1970 when I knew everything, because in 1970, I thought I did. I was interviewing a gifted child in the California school system. The Army was putting me through a master's program in psychology. And I had to interview a, a, a gifted kid. 
and uh, I thought I knew everything. And you know, I was this little kid about yay high, playing with Tinker Toys, sitting at a table. And and they said, well, he's really bright. He has 168 IQ. I want you to interview him for a couple hours and get debriefed by me, and we'll see what happens. So I went out and talked with this kid, and he was extremely, extremely bright. And after it was over, I went and, and talked to my preceptor, and he said, how did it go? And I said, no, oh, you know, he's a kid, and I'm not. And you know, I guess he's bright. And he said, did you ask him philosophical questions? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, go back after lunch and ask him philosophical questions. So I went back after lunch and I said, John, which is not his real name, I said, do you believe in God? And he said, is that microphone on? And it was because it was a teaching classroom. And I said, yes, it's on. And he says, well, I'll tell you my answer, but I don't want my mom and dad to know. So I'm, uh, I, can we go out and sit on the play equipment and I'll tell you my answer? And I thought, okay. We go out and sit on the play equipment and I said, okay, what's your answer? And he says, no, I don't believe in God. And I said, what's the big deal? You don't want your mom and dad to know. And he said, oh, well, you know, they're Christians, and they actually think God is something tangible that gives them direction and focus, and it doesn't work for me. He says, I go to church, I go to Sunday school. I know I'm different, but I don't believe in their God. Now, I was raised strict Roman Catholic. I had a different in fact. I was going to hell just talking to this kid, OK? <laughs> and, and I'm listening to this kid talk. And, and I said, who's your God? And he said, well, I believe in you, and I believe in Mr. Richmond, who was my preceptor and his science teacher. And he named off Albert Schweitzer, who was a, a physician you know, from Belgium who uh, worked in the Congo. And he named off two or three other people who I subsequently found out were theoretical physicists. You know, and I can tell you the rest of the story another time. But here's what happened. I said to him then, OK, that's your perception of God. Do you believe in an afterlife, a heaven or hell? And a five-year-old kid held his fist out two feet from my face, and he said, no. He said, Mr. Hiller, if I had the date of your death in my hand, would you want to know it? And I said, yeah, I'd want to know it. And he said, how come? Now, you notice the roles are reversed. He's interviewing me. The pressure's off. And I said to him, yeah, I'd like to know it. And he said, well, why? And I probably took 40 to 50 seconds and told him the great American fantasy, according to Bill Hiller, get married kids happily ever after, all that stuff that, you know, that, that we read about that somehow doesn't happen. And he looked at me like kids do when they know they have you in the palm of their hand. And he said, that's interesting. What makes you think you're going to live past tonight? Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> because I was born to upper middle class white parents. If I fell into a toilet, I'd come out with a trout in my mouth. You know, if I want milk from a cow, I'd go outside and, you know, with a, p a pail and a stool, sit down, hold my hands out, wait for the cow to back up. He made me, put me in touch with the fact that, you know, that I was going to die. And that's what happened when the planes hit the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. It put a lot of us in touch with our mortality. And you know, if you don't have a learning plan, right, if you just roll with the punches, uh, you, you're not growing, you know. You better figure out the future you want and be working toward it. Because if a terrorist decides when you're down in Las Vegas to bomb the MGM Grand Hotel, which has I don't know how many thousands of rooms, and you die, wouldn't it be nicer to go out saying, yeah, I was living it, rather than I'm waiting for it? You know, are you a vessel waiting to be filled, or are you filling your own vessel? Is you waiting for your ship to come in, or did you not realize you were steering it? You know, you got to live your life out loud. That is so important. The other thing that's different is that we have already seen that we're probably going to lose some of our freedoms and our rights, or they're going to have to be constricted. Things are going to have to be a little different. I don't want to do that. I really like our freedoms here. The Constitution is probably the best document ever conceived. And, and I'll tell you, I, 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 I don't want to do that. But I'm willing to do it if it means that I'll be protected and the people I love will be protected. And the other thing is that it's probably time now to re-examine our spiritual and religious paths and beliefs. There's something exceedingly different about somebody who is called to prayer five times a day and they pray versus somebody who may go to church or a synagogue or a temple or whatever once a week either because they want to or because that's the thing to do or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. Some of the things that maybe we have learned that we don't know that we've learned are this. Um, the terrorists, and I haven't defined that yet, the terrorists that we're going to be confronted with are totally different than they were 10 years ago. They're not unlike the kids who go into our junior and senior high schools and start plinking off their friends. There are three core characteristics of religious terrorists, and it's the religious terrorists that are going to cause us the most problems. One of the core characteristics is this, is that violence is a sacramental act or a divine right given a religious terrorist by what he or she believes is a, theolo a, a theological imperative. And because of that, there are no constraints that people have. A lot of people ask me, how can you be a suicide bomber? 
It's pretty simple. If you live in Israel, you know what the answer is to that. It's very simple to be a suicide bomber. Very simple. You're doing it because you're getting into heaven, you know? The second thing that's different about terrorists, you know, and, you know, one is it's, a, it's a, a, an imperative, is that religious terrorists don't appeal to a constituency. They're not saying, do this, and here's a ransom, and if we get the ransom, we'll do this. They don't, they don't have a constituency. They do it not because they want us, you know, to, to be aggrandized in the eyes of somebody else. They do it because they think it's right for themselves. And, and we don't know who they are. I mean, there's hundreds of them living in this country. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And the third thing is that religious terrorists don't seek to be a, a component of something. They don't want a seat at the table. They want the table. They don't want to be a part of something. They want you and everybody else to be like they are. And ladies and gentlemen, that is significantly different than we've ever had, had experienced in our lives or been confronted with. And, you know, if it ever crosses your mind that, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, we, yeah, we, we, you know, it's like it used to be when the Hamas or the uh, uh, Hezbollah would hijack planes, you know, for the PLO uh, in, uh, in Algeria or Beirut or Morocco. Uh, it's not like that anymore. Uh, they, 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 won't, they won't go through the, the middle step. They'll just, you know, kill you. It's that simple. I'm not a warmonger. I don't like war. I've been in a couple. Um, but I also uh, uh, have uh, some other experiences that are maybe unlike some of that you've had, and, and I'm not trying to excite you or, or sensationalize anything, but uh, I, s I spent a, a couple of weeks in North Africa not long ago, and uh, I listened to Al Jazeera Network, which is the network that is 24-hour a day uh, beamed down by a satellite, and Al Jazeera is where Osama bin Laden and his group had released the videotapes, you know, that they say are real or not real or whatever, and to listen for 24 hours a day to the fomentation of what is on there, you know, the message is kill anybody who lives in the United States or, or, or uh, Israel. Uh, and destroy the economy, and it doesn't make any difference if you go to their country or if you do it while they're traveling, just do it, because that's what we're supposed to do. And that's frightening when I sit there listening to that. And it's dubbed, it's, it's, you know, it's spoken in Arabic, but how it comes across is you read the subtitles, and the subtitles are in English. And that's pretty scary. Cairo is the third largest city in the world. There's 20 million people there, a thousand a day move into there. And, and this is on television, and it scares the hell out of me. Uh, and it should scare the hell out of you. And I'm not just talking about Muslims. I think the biggest danger, in fact, let me get into this right away. Wait a minute, how much time do I have left? Seven. Seven minutes? Okay, a couple of things. One is that uh, the media, our media, is going to have to do something other than be exclusive or first heard here or only uh, such and such uh, and, and be concerned about prime time. If, if the media does, you know, doesn't stop doing what they're doing and, and, and uh, you know, giving us information we can make informed decisions about, then we're going to be in trouble. And I, I will tell you this, that most of the media, and I'm talking about NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox, and maybe there's people who represent that, it's chewing gum for the mind. You know, uh, it, my mentality. You know, that's, that's how I look at it. Most of the stuff on television uh, like that is, is something we, we need to be concerned about. If you want to get information, go to the library, go to forums, go to schools, go to colleges, get on the Internet. And, uh, and not that everything on the Internet is great. Another thing that you need to be aware of is that our intelligence communities, particularly the big three, the CIA, the NSA, and, and, uh, and the FBI, really are beginning to work together. They've siloed all their life. They haven't had to, you know, to share information. And so all the data we had out there, which is really random bits of information that don't mean anything to anybody, it becomes information when you begin to share it. And we're just beginning to share it, and now the information has become knowledge, so we can make decisions based on that knowledge. But we've never had to do that before. After the Cold War, we didn't know how to react. But I will tell you now that those three agencies are working together, and uh, they're finally upgrading their computers, uh, and, and they're actually training people how to use them. And there's a little cynicism in my voice because it, it surprised me that they weren't as far advanced as I thought they were. But again, I watch television and I read novels, and, you know, it's not real. Okay? The other thing is this, is that we've got to start understanding other countries. Um, just like we have to understand other people that work in your organization or sit at the table with you because they're always thinking something different. I had a friend who just came back from Egypt with me, and she was sitting in a, uh, um, uh, an Internet, uh, um, what do you call it, a restaurant. And uh, somebody said to her, uh, where are you from? And she said, uh, uh, United States. And he said, America? And she said, yeah. And he says, oh, you don't like us. 
And she said, what do you mean we don't like you? You know, well, you know, you think we bombed, uh, and she said, well, yeah, 16 of the, you know, people in those planes were from Egypt, but it, what do you mean we don't like you? And he began to tell us, and you know, disinformation is a huge thing. Are you aware that the information that went out to most Muslim countries after the bombing of our Pentagon and our World Trade Center, what it said was this, was that it was actually an act committed by the Israelis to throw, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to throw America on to uh, um, fighting Muslims. And what they said was that 4,000 Jews, who American Jews, who worked in the World Trade Center were told not to go to work that day because they were going to have people go in there and bomb that. Have you heard that before? Yeah, it's real, and that's the tip of the iceberg. This country is great in terms of freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of, of press, and all those types of things. Other countries, it's not like that. And I tell you, if you've never been out of this country or taken the time to really talk to anybody who's been out of this country, we need to do that so that we don't start making the, you know, the, the crazy decisions that perhaps we've made in the past. Um, the other thing I need to say is that the community, our local law enforcement here in Portland, or I don't care where you live in the United States, and the media have got to begin to work together. Because there are going to be things that are going to be happening in this country that uh, are going to startle us. And law enforcement people are going to react in one way, and media people are going to react in one way, and you and I are going to react in one way. And we need to start learning what we're doing, and how we're doing it, and why we're doing it, so that we, you know, we don't get all uh, confabulated. What we can expect is this. If there's anybody in this room that doesn't think that there are tactical nuclear weapons, and by the way, current technology, a tactical nuclear, nuclear weapon, a one kiloton weapon is as big as an NFL football. Do you think you can smuggle one into this country, up the Willamette River? Do you think other people don't have them? General Leadbed, who was a, the, you know, the general working for Yeltsin, said that, you know what, we can't account for 84 of our tactical nukes. Where do you think they are? Well, they're probably being guarded by, you know, alcoholic red guard, uh, you know, who would rather be protecting potatoes because it's more valuable than a tactical nuclear weapon. But you know what? If, if I want to get a tactical nuclear weapon and I have the money to pay for it, do you think I could convince some guard to give it to me? Yeah. What's our inventory control? Nuclear, biological, chemical weapons? Are a real problem. Don't think that terrorists will just attack us, you know, with a big flashbang. They won't. I mean, they're probably already developing uh, strains of bacteria and viruses that are immune to anything we've developed. You don't have to do it slowly. You don't have to do it fast. Just do it. You need to, you need to be concerned about that. Another thing I think is if you don't understand cyber terrorism, you better understand it. Computers right now control everything from, you know, our geopositioning satellites to our phone systems, our communication systems, and I can go on and on and on, but the thing that scares the hell out of me is this, is that 95% of our military weapons, defense, uh, 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 and, and aggressive stances, every 95% of them go through commercial channels. And there are 17 million people in this country between the ages of 12 and death who know how to tap in or hack into or will find a way over the internet because it's public knowledge, it's one of the rights we have in this country, to screw us up. And you know what? It will happen. And it's already happened. There's already been an 11-year-old in the Midwest who shut down the phone system in seven states for six hours. That's it. One minute. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm really passionate. I, I, what I need to say is this. Um, we have an opportunity now to reconstruct our country. How we relate to each other, how our government works, how to be responsible, how to be solution focused, how to not have our heads in the sand, and, and how to not take a look at politics as a real issue. And, and politics is a real issue, but you know, our constituency really is. I get ticked off when I hear what happened at Enron, at WorldCom. People making millions of dollars and people who have worked for years for these companies are now destitute and bankrupt. And, and you know, that's a symptom. And our government needs to realize that, hey, you know, if we're going to have a, 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 um, some changes, we've we got to have them now and let's start making them. And the way to do that is this. And, and, and I. Well, there's a lot of ways. You probably questions and answers. I'll leave you with one thing. Uh, then we have question and answer. Um, there's a fellow that walked into a bar. He had, had a bad day, and he walked into a bar one night, and he was the only one there. And it was one of those bars that was long. And the bartender was down there washing glasses. 
And uh, the bartender came and says, what do you have? And he said, well, just bring me a Bud Light. So he brought him a Bud Light and retreated back down to the sink and was washing glasses, watching TV. And the guy took his first sip of beer and he heard a voice in his head say, nice tie. And he's thinking, my God, I'm working hard. He had another sip and the same voice said, nice shirt. Your tie and shirt match. And he's thinking, what the heck's going on? This is candid camera. He looks under the bar, see if there's a lens. There's nothing there. You know, he has one more sip, and he hears the same voice say, you're a pretty sharp dresser. And he says, bartender? And the bartender came around and says, yeah, what's, is there a problem? He says, we're the only two people in here? Yeah. Is this candid camera? No, why? He says, well, it's strange. Every time I have a sip of beer, I hear a voice saying nice things about me and complimenting me. And the bartender says, ah, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. It's the peanuts. They're complimentary. <laughs> you were waiting for something else. Be a peanut. Be a peanut. If you watch a videotape that I watched the other day, two people who did not know each other on the 82nd floor of the second tower that went down, the flames were behind them. And you know what the heat is like if you've ever been in a fire. They took a look at each other. One of them ran up to the other one. They grabbed hands and jumped 82 feet, 82 stories, three and a half seconds to their death. Grab each other's hands. I'm not saying do it now. We need to reach out and touch ourselves, more, well, teach other people more often. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Edit that out. <laughs> We need to reach out and touch ourselves and other people so that the things that are happening to this country, which have been happening, by the way, all over the world to other countries, so that they don't happen here. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you Colonel Hiller. You, you uh, touched on the subject of understanding other countries. Um, the foreign press following 9-11 was almost universally uh, sympathetic to what had happened, many editorialized that perhaps at last the Americans would lose this extraordinary insularity that they have. Has there been a permanent change in attitudes um, among us as, uh, as world citizens as well as Americans? Good question. Um, I don't think there has. I don't think we have. I think we're still where we were a year ago before the attack. I think we've become numb. And the reason probably is because that's our human nature. And a lot of us want to deny it because I don't want to, you know, if I see something uncomfortable, I don't want to, you know, deal with it sometime. If I look in a mirror and don't like what I see, I won't look in a mirror. Uh, and I think that happens. And, and I think it's happened to us. And by the way, we're removed. I mean, it, every, every, you know, every other week it used to be the FBI had a report out, we're now at level five or, or level green. And pretty soon people say, well, you're calling Wolf. And, and we can't get that complacent, I'm sorry. We, 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 you need to, to continue to educate yourself. We need to be uh, diligent. So I, I just don't believe that it's changed. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Um, here's what scares me. <laughs> um, in the spirit of living our civic life out loud, isn't part of our learning and responsibility following September 11th to review as citizens and to speak out on the foreign policy that our nation has lived by in the last 50 years. Nuclear brinkmanship, increasing isolationism, departure from our commitment to the United Nations and international peacekeeping treaties and environmental treaties to which we were once committed, our support of oppressive governments and sale of arms based on protecting oil interests, and our lack of commitment to what I consider genuine principles of democracy. Tell me your name again. Carol Witherell. I, we need to applaud her. <laughs> this is a woman who understands the way of the world. And if you don't really understand what she just said, you need to seek her out and talk to her. Because what she said is the foundational crux of the problem. We need to take a stand. I mean, I, I, people say the government. Well, I'm the government, I vote. You're the government, you vote. We need to take a look at those issues, and specifically those issues. You know, in 1977, with the creation of OPEC, we not only sold our technology, but our soul. And, and, and that's the tip of the iceberg. We need to do that. Yes, I agree. I, you know, I hardly 
endorse what you're saying. How to do it, I don't know, but uh, we need to do it. Start by right all our congressmen and women. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. I'm uh, Carter Kennedy, City Club member, and uh, I was thinking about what you said about our freedoms and civil rights, or and it seems like um, being in the land of the free goes along with being in the home of the brave. And I remember uh, Mayor Giuliani saying pe telling to people, "Be brave." Uh, do you think that people are being brave, or are they being cowardly and wanting protection instead of freedom? Boy, you know, and again, it's just me. I, I think what Giuliani was talking about then, being brave, was, you know, uh, you see your fear, travel through it, we'll get through this, we'll, we'll retrieve what we have to in the Pentagon and the World Trade Center, and, and we'll go on. But I think it goes a lot further than that, and perhaps he was talking about something, you know, on a greater level. But we are, the, you know, the home of the free, some of us. Some of us literally are not. Uh, living here, and uh, um, uh, and the home of the brave. Do I think some of us are brave? Yeah, I think some of us are. But you know, the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. I, I think we, it probably works there. And if you don't know what that is, that's 80 percent of the people are responsible for 20 percent of what goes on, and vice versa. And I think 80 percent of the people might be brave, and 20 percent of the people are. It might be reversed than that. But my my true feeling is this: is is that I think everybody I've come in contact with in this country really wants to do good. Nobody, n no snowflake in a snowstorm ever thought he was responsible for an avalanche. You know. But, but they are, and, and you know, big things start with one person. And, I, and to be brave means, despite whatever you think is going on around you, if you stick to your principles and you have the integrity, damn it, people are going to catch on to that, and, and you're going to get an avalanche. And, and I think we need to do that. I don't know if that answers your question. It might be a cop out, but yeah, I think I think basically we are brave. I, I tell you, if something were to happen, we would pull together. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, right now, our Congress is debating the uh, advisability of using military force in Iraq. Um, you know something about military force. Uh, could you speak to that issue as to what's the feasibility of, let's say, a surgical operation or this becoming, escalating to something dealing with urban warfare and what the consequences might be? I knew I would be asked that. And my answer is this. Militarily, we're the greatest country in the world, and it would take nothing to go in there surgically or not surgically to destroy whoever and whatever the hell we want. But is that right? My personal opinion is this, is that if we decide to attack Iraq, it will be one of the stupidest damn things this country has ever done. And I will tell you why. It, it, look what, you know, Mohammed Karzai had an assassination attempt in Afghanistan yesterday. In fact, a lot of people were killed over there after we went in and, and supposedly kicked the Taliban and Al-Qaeda out. You do not know what you're dealing with going to other countries. You know, we have separation of church and state. Muslim countries don't. They live their religion. If you want to upset people who have a passion for killing us any way they can, go in and destroy their country. There's got to be a different way than military intervention, surgical or not. It scared the hell out of me the, the first time in years that I've come back into this country after being out and, and being in North Africa. When I crossed the border, I said, God, thank you. I, 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 I'm scared to death. And if we go into Iraq, we don't have anybody to replace Saddam Hussein with, you know? Do we have anybody to replace, uh, you know, Mohammed Karzai with? No. I, I was in Afghanistan for two and a half years training the Mujahideen after the Russians attacked in 1979. And I will tell you this, there were seven warlords that were there that controlled the opium trade. And you know what? They're still there. A and do you think when they get rid of us that they'll go back to it? Yes, because that's all they know. Is it our business? No, unless you want the oil that's underneath the ground. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, Michael Ray, City Club member. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, qu the question should have been asked, what kind of portfolio of nasty weapons does Saddam Hussein have? Uh, In uh, other words, what, what, what is the solution to that problem? 
I, I don't know the solution, but if it was me, the solution I would, I would use is that well, I would... I would what, what kind of weapons? Um, I hear that Saddam Hussein has... Uh, a, in fact, after the, after the, uh, uh, the war in, in 91, when uh, the peacekeepers went in and we really examined what they had, we found that they had tons of sarin, uh, a lot of anthrax, like uh, enough to destroy, you know, most of North America, South America, uh, botulism, um, and, and a lot of other exotic um, uh, gases that you know that are like stored in Tuolumne, Utah, or Umatilla. Uh, and I mean, the the problem was that they didn't have a delivery system. But we don't need a sophisticated delivery system. We can just fly a 747 in and, and do something with it. Or if you really want to know what the problem is, our general aviation needs to be overhauled because, you know, I was going to fly down here in a plane that I that I could rent because I'm a private pilot. And you know, if I had a if I had the wherewithal to, uh, you know, really make a scene, uh, you know, I'd load that thing up with uh, ricin, which you can make, uh, which is the third toxic substance known to man. Uh, first there's plutonium, you know, then there's botulism, then there's ricin, but you can make it by distilling castor beans. You can get the, the method for doing that on the internet. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of that around. But that's what he has. My, my guess is he also has tactical nuclear weapons. And that scares me. Hi, my name is Mark Allen. Just very quickly, what you see is the result of not having television for 20 years. I so undo glass art for entertainment. Um, I want to make one quick observation and a question. First of all, for media alternatives, I've been very happy with a radio station here in Portland, cable radio. They seem to have a good alternative to news. Uh, the question I have is, I hear references to football-sized nuclear weapons, which you just made, and so-called, quote, suitcase-sized nuclear weapons. I'm having trouble getting into perspective the damage those, those can do, say, compared to Hiroshima or, you know, a truckload of dynamite. You know, can you provide some sort of perspective on what kind of damage a football size, a suitcase size weapon can do? Sure. Thank you. Have you been to Manhattan by any chance? I'm sorry? Have you been to Manhattan? Yes. Okay. It would be dust if one of those was lit off rather than uh, the planes flying into the World Trade Center. Dust, flat, like the pictures we saw of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It would be flat. Okay, Manhattan? Yes. Would be flat? Absolutely. From one weapon? Absolutely. <laughs> flat. Okay, what was the size of Hiroshima? Oh, Fat Boy was probably, um, I don't know, uh, diameter wise. Uh, no, the oh, the tonnage, I don't know, was quite a bit. They, they had to take everything off of the B 29 that delivered it. Just the, the yield, the yield. How many oh. I don't know how many kilotons it was. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Ray Polanyi, a city club member. Uh, after World War I, we primarily sponsored the League of Nations. And uh, it worked for a very limited time, and then it failed. After World War II, we got the United Nations. And I think it's much, much better than the League of Nations. But we don't want to participate enough. And yet, it's the only world forum. Uh, I think we need to work with the world. I think we need to work all together. Uh, recently, w when we talk about Iraq, everybody else has said, mm -mm, you, you go. We won't. Uh, but I think we still have United Nations, and I think we should really go in wholeheartedly. The world opinion, perhaps, is the only thing that can stop the madness of the others. So I don't know. What do you think? I, I concur. I, I think we need the world opinion. Um, I, it's understand if you ever, if you lived in Europe or North Africa, you would understand why other countries will not want to participate. And, and I, you know, if I can just quickly tell you why. Remember years back when we bombed uh, Libya? We, we were going after Muammar Gaddafi, and the French would not, and the Spanish would not let us fly our planes from Britain over, you know, instead of going around and then coming up Gibraltar and across. And the reason was they were afraid that they would have repercussions. They would have terrorism, which was rampant in those countries. Uh, they were afraid that, the, that uh, it, you know, that uh, Libya, would, you know, the terrorist network would then go in there and start killing them again. And they, they were legitimately concerned. 
And, and to prove their point, what happened not long after that, when Gaddafi found out that the planes, our American planes, took off from, uh, from England, was that he wired $2 million to the Irish Republican Army so that they could kick Britain's ass through a bank that was chartered in this country, which is a little ironic. Um, so th the network is huge. It is not just a group of people. There are, you know, there's a network out there. And part of the network is in this country, the militia of Montana. You know, the Viper One uh, militia that's in, uh, you know, in Arizona, the Big Star uh, militia that's in Texas, the militia of Montana. There's probably five million radical people like Timothy McVeigh who can now be resourced by people who have the resources and shown how to use them to destroy uh, internally what's going on in this country. It, there is a concern. We need to have, you know, we need to work with the rest of the world. I'm sorry. We have time for one question. Betsy Warren, City Club. You started talking about restructuring, and I wish you could say some more about that and how it would apply to the dangers that you have been talking about. Restructuring? Our nation. Oh. Um, start with a lot of alcohol. No, I'm being, I'm being facetious. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wish it was as simple as saying, you know what, you got to walk the talk. When your actions and your self-talk um, and what you think are congruent, then things will work. But you know what, that's not the way it is. And I think we need to start gearing ourselves individually first to walk the talk. If we say something to one person, we better say the same damn thing to somebody else regardless. If we tell uh, the government of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, Tajikistan that we're going to do such and such, and we better tell the government of, uh, um, you know, Kiev the same thing. Uh, and, and I, you know, I don't know the answer, but I do know I'm not 28 anymore, and I don't have testosterone anymore. Uh, and um, but what I do have is a mentality that says, you know what, we got to do something different. We have to do it differently. And I'm tired of uh, of listening to politicians, and it's not just politicians; it's my neighbors. You know, uh, saying one thing and doing something else, and, and you know, it's it's a sickness that we got to get over in this country. We we've got to start doing something different. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. I wish, man, if I did, I wouldn't be here. I would not be here, but we, we need to start, integrity is real important, and trust. You know, trust is a basic common denominator of, uh, uh, of, of motivating people, and I don't know whether I can trust anymore, to be honest with you. Yeah, I still will carry out the uh, foreign policy of the United States, and I've done things in the past that were against me morally and ethically, and I probably will do it again. Uh, primarily because uh, I guess I have the ability to, and I signed an, an oath that said that I would. Um, but I will tell people about it. I won't do it with impunity. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Miller, for coming to Portland and sharing such a serious topic. Uh, City Club is adjourned.